All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, this is David. Uh, thanks for being here this morning for our October uh, Science Communication Webinar. So with that, uh, I will start uh, the introduction for John. As you might remember, a month or so ago, I sent out a request for suggestions for webinars just to see if there were ideas out there, things people wanted to hear about that we were not including so far and today's presentation by John was one of the suggestions that came back from that request. Uh, so John's presentation as you can see is habitat management on private lands improve, improving habitat where we're not in charge. Uh, John is the wildlife habitat coordinator uh, in the wildlife management division for our agency uh, and with that John I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, David. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with everybody this morning and uh, sorry I'm not showing up on camera. We'll take care of that at the end of the presentation when we start answering some questions. But um, like Dr. Cobb said, you know, to begin with, I was uh, approached to discuss the farm bill. And the more I thought about it, uh, that would not be a very exciting conversation to have for uh, 30 or 45 minutes. So uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the Farm Bill, which was the request that that led to me talking today. But you know, before that, we want to make sure we address private, private and corporate lands and how we can manage these in North Carolina. As you can see on this slide, we uh, have a large amount of our state is private or corporate or, or non-governmentally owned property. And for years, we've made efforts to impact private lands, uh, working with private landowners to try to enhance habitat on their property. And there can be lots of potential there, also lots of frustration. So we wanted to talk about the importance of private lands and how we can get through some of these things and make a bigger impact on private lands across the state. So just to start out, um, so one time I had this supervisor and there's lots of things that could fill in those little dots. But uh, one thing about Mark Jones is very, very opinionated. And any of y'all that have worked with Mark would know that. And also very data driven and research driven. So, you know, whenever he got the position as my supervisor back when I was a tab working with private landowners, um, one of the first performance appraisals that I had, he, he brought up my pause statements and looked to see how many landowners I had had contact with in the last six months. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing any results. I'm seeing these outreach and, and lands and site visits, but I'm not seeing results. And uh, he was not real pleased with that. So what had really happened is Mark had gotten this data from the National Woodland Owners Association or a, a survey, National Woodland Owner Survey. And, you know, if you start looking at these numbers, it gives us lots of things to be happy about as private land wildlife biologists and, and promoting our private lands program. And, you know, if we start looking at what's important to landowners, you know, a lot of things jump out at us that are beneficial for wildlife as well. Just wildlife habitat enhancement, privacy on your land, beauty, scenery, biological diversity, you know, lots of good things that we can build off of with a private lands program. And, you know, so Mark got this and, and knew we had potential out there. So we took a little bit closer look at this data and, and this is kind of what we found when we started looking at interest in managing for wildlife and the landowner's initial intentions. And, you know, we could lump these things together into a couple different groups. And then if we wanted to encompass all the results of this survey, we wind up with something that looked kind of like that. So if we look back at the survey results, we can see that a lot of reasons for land ownership have to do with uh, emotional ties, uh, intrinsic values, things that 
aren't necessarily easy to manage or easy to set goals and objectives for. And they're really hard to define in some instances, like improve wildlife habitat. You know, what does that mean? Everybody's going to have a little different meaning to that. So to help explain why I hadn't sealed the deal, if you will, on any habitat projects in the, the previous six months that Mark had questioned, I brought up the next piece of information from the Woodland Landowner Survey. And that's, you know, forest landowner concern. So we know what landowners want out of their property, but what concerns they run into on their property or, or for owning property. And, you know, high property taxes, trespasses, poaching, wildfires, another one that's important to most folks, unwanted insects and disease, wind and ice damage, and damage from animals. So there again, to, to try to get this better visualized, kind of graphed it a different way. So if we look at likelihood of implementing management prescriptions and landowner satisfaction, you know, we can we can take a look and, and this doesn't really have a pattern to it, why people do what they do and what's the likelihood that they're gonna do something until we get creative with the way that we group these folks together. So we start seeing a shape like that is important. And if we try to find the median, that's about kind of where it's going to be. So we start looking at concerns for land ownership. A lot of that has to do with financial gain. And then you've got these folks over here who have a, a high likelihood of implementing management, don't really care about the money. And, and those are pretty much unicorns that we uh, run into every once in a while. But there again, looking back at forest landowner concerns, property taxes, trespass, wildfire, insect and disease damage, wind and ice, all these things can certainly impact the cost of land ownership, the cost of land management. So even though a lot of the goals and objectives that folks have for their property are very emotionally tied, when it comes right down to it, their concerns are financially based for most of the landowners we we operate with. So, you know, if we think about landowners even further though, the diversity and the questions and, and the challenges we run into looking at those graphs from the, the Woodland Owner Survey really don't even touch this the surface, scratch the surface with what actually is happening when we go out and talk with landowners. Every landowner has a little different goal, objective, a little different challenge, a little different ability, a little different desire for their property. And, you know, it takes a, a unique approach that's not quite as cut and dry as we're going to go out and do X, Y, and Z to make this project happen. Um, so it does take a lot of adaptability when working with private landowners to have a successful project. And, you know, this is not a new thought. Um, Aldo Leopold seemed to capture this pretty well back in 1937. You know, we ultimately always throw back on the individual ethic as the basis of land conservation. It's hard to make a man or woman by pressure of law and money do a thing that does not spring naturally in their sense of right and wrong. So we're always working with landowners, emotions, their challenges, whenever we're trying to have a successful private lands program. So that kind of leads to the question of how do we you know, have successful private lands projects whenever we're dealing with so many variables and concerns. And, you know, that's something that you really have to understand and approach uh, each landowner differently. Like this family, for instance, this is a family that owns a tract of land in Scotland County. Um, they work very well together. But, you know, I think we have to meet the landowners where they are as far as where they are in the process of management, where they are in the process of understanding options. And, you know, we have to understand what we're asking them to do and how that's going to impact their life. Um, for example, you know, financial needs, generational influences, which can be very important decision-making complexities. 
management implications and opportunity cost and just the general cost of ownership. You know, this family, for example, uh, much of their property is owned by a family corporation. So three cousins uh, kind of are the voting members for each branch of the family. And uh, you know, one branch of the family is a little more tied to the financial needs from the property. Another one enjoys the outdoor and environmental opportunities, recreation opportunities. But all these folks have to be taken into consideration whenever you're making recommendations for a property like this. Um, so, you know, a couple specific examples here. This is a, a fairly nice long leaf stand in um, Harnett County that Deanna Noble's worked on for quite a few years now. And, you know, if it was just a matter of going out and making management prescriptions on this stand, it would be pretty easy. You know, we could figure out and we know how to manage this stand. But it really comes down to nobody cares what you know until they know that you care when it comes to private land ownership. And one of the main ways that we can, you know, care about these landowners and, and, and know what they're going through is to identify the real cost of habitat management. You know, what are we really asking them to put put up for this greater good of managing longleaf longleaf ecosystem. And you know, if we start taking a look at some fairly firm numbers, property taxes, you know, property taxes is one of those things that we all have to deal with. And uh, you can see that just having a present use value or wildlife conservation land program option greatly reduces the tax bill. But we're still looking at, you know, $5 an acre that uh, annually that would have to be paid in property taxes. So if we're recommending prescribed burning on this track, you know, we're looking at 30 to $50 an acre. And then if we factor in that we're going to be burning on a two year rotation and fire lines need to be maintained and some other work, you know, we might be looking at 20 to, to $30 an acre annually for management and maintenance costs here. So, you know, if we really think about it, $26 a year per acre is not that much for a landowner to give up to manage their property the way they want to. But, you know, we're missing some major factors here. Foregone income. In Longleaf Stand, especially, we've got uh, timber revenue that can be lost there. Longleaf especially, what about the straw that could be produced that could be finan a financial gain to this landowner? So when we factor all this together and, and figure out how many acres Mr. Herndon was managing at the time, about $476 in management foregone income. So, uh, you know, you're looking at for those four eggs, he's taking notes on there about $12,000 per egg. So that gets pretty pricey whenever we start asking folks to manage their property. Uh, when we look at what it actually costs them to do this kind of work. And, you know, early successional habitat, another thing that we really focus on, and, and there's certainly some real cost associated with that as well. There again, the comparison and the reduction we get whenever we use a uh, tax deferment program prescribed burning and fire line installation. If we're burning on a two year rotation, that's kind of what that equals annually. And then the other management that's needed, you know, herbicide disking mowing. Um, you know, how are we keeping that succession set at the stage that we want? And there again, you know, $40 an acre a year, not that much to really ask a landowner to do. But what about agricultural return? This landowner is missing about $60 per acre per year in what they could be generating in revenue uh, if they had row crops uh, or grazing opportunities on this property instead. So looking at this project site, you know, we're looking at this landowner giving up almost $25,000 a year uh, to benefit, you know, various songbirds and, and pollinators on their property. So, you know, you look at it cost per acre, it's not a big deal when we look at these really valuable projects on the landscape. Uh, it can get a pretty big landowner contribution 
that is coming out of their pockets to, to do this work. So we come back to this fellow again and. You know, conservation ultimately will boil down to rewarding private landowners who can serve the public interest wildlife habitat. So, you know, how do we reward landowners? Of course, we love signs. We have calendars we can give away. We give folks bird houses sometimes. We have these really nice knives that we give to some folks that help us out. And everybody loves an orange hat. So, you know, thinking about giving a, a landowner who is putting out $25,000 every year to manage early successional habitat, uh, is a hat suitable? So I guess the bigger question is how how can we reward these landowners to improve wildlife habitat management on private lands, but also incentivize management at a higher level? And you know, looking at those numbers previously, property tax deferments are are a big deal to landowners. And with wildlife, we have the Wildlife Conservation Land Program. And just real quickly to go over that. Similar to the present use value program, which is forestry, horticulture and agriculture um, deferments. Uh, ownership is more family based with uh, individuals, family businesses, family trust and family members that are tenants in common. You have to have 20 contiguous acres of habitat, not just 20 contiguous acres of land. Uh, four year ownership tenure, but there are some exceptions to that. And you have to have a habitat agreement with. Uh, the Wildlife Commission to be part of that program. And there's three qualifying classifications or criteria. Criteria one are protected species that um, are, are noted in the uh, protected species list that can be found um, in the general statute. Priority habitat type. There again, we've got six habitat types that qualify under criterion two. And then wildlife reserve land, which is a little different. It's land that's actively and regularly used to reserve as a reserve for hunting, fishing, shooting, wildlife observation, and wildlife activities. So, you know, we kind of stepped away from the species and the habitat type with criterion three and moved more into the uh, human use of the wildlife resource being a qualifi qualification for the deferment. And uh, you have to follow the, the habitat agreement under criterion three, and uh, the habitat agreement has to include implementation of at least three of these seven uh, management practices. So food, water, shelter, habitat control, erosion control, predator control, and census of animal population. And just to kind of recap where we're at with this program, um, certainly there's been a lot more demand for WCLP in the western third, especially, but western half of the, the state. Um, and a lot of that's because there were more qualifying habitat types there up until uh, criteria three was passed back in 2019. And there again, one of the first questions that landowners ask and a lot of our sta staff ask also is. You know, how much will WCLP reduce tax valuations and you know the examples previously um, kind of sum that up fairly well. Uh, they're going to vary the, the tax, the property tax reduction or deferment is going to vary by county. It's going to vary by soil type. It's going to vary by the uh, fair market value of the property. But all in all, these are some pretty good ideas of, of what you would wind up going down to uh, as far as property valuations through WCLP. So we know that reducing tax values that that gets or tax uh, liabilities that gets landowners attention pretty quick. But you know, how else can we, we reward landowners and You know, we start talking about implementing substantial practices on on a piece of private land. It, it does cost and cost share or financial assistance is important to a lot of landowners to be able to implement and maintain these practices. And 
you know, with wildlife habitat enhancement, Farm Bill is a, a primary option that we look at as far as how can we help a landowner get funded to implement management on their property. So to cover the information about the Farm Bill, we'll, we'll fly through this. The Farm Bill can be very complicated. Um, a lot of folks just kind of glaze over when you start talking about the Farm Bill and, and the the details of it. So we'll just go through a few major major factors and uh, then we'll move on to the next thing. But so the 28, 2018 Farm Bill initially was about $867 billion. Uh, I have those little asterisks there because there is no telling how much additional funding has been put into that in the last couple of years with uh, with different acts and spending bills that have used the farm bill to distribute funds uh, from other legislation. It guides most agricultural and nutrition policies in the United States. And it is reauthorized about every five years right now. Uh, it's up for reauthorization. Most all the the conservation organizations are are getting information in on their farm bill platforms to try to shape the next farm bill, which should come out hopefully in 2023. The, the farm bill titles, there are 12 titles or 12 chapters, and the one that we usually look at most from a habitat management uh, program standpoint is the conservation title. But the farm bill really has to do and impacts lots of other factors um, across the country. And you can you can see these things from crop insurance to school nutrition programs, job creation, um, wetland protection, housing and development. Lots of different um, things are funded through the Farm Bill. So at least on the initial breakdown, Whenever the bill was passed back in 2018, nutrition programs, just call it 75 percent, would have would have been directed towards nutrition programs. Only about 7 percent directed towards conservation programs. So that tells you know, just how widespread and how impactful the farm bill is to not just landowners, not just farmers, not just conservationists, but you know, the general public as a whole has a has a lot of say and a lot of political. Uh, ammunition is used in shaping the farm bill. Um, have these question marks by nutrition and, and conservation because again, with all the additional funding that has been uh, put through the farm bill, I have no idea if these percentages would be anywhere close to accurate or not. So whenever we start talking about a little more detail about farm bill programs, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service and the Farm Service Agency are the, the two big agencies that handle most of the uh, Farm Bill programs. Some of the complaints that we often hear about Farm Bill is that it's rather cumbersome to sign up for. Cumbersome might be an understatement. There's lots of eligibility forms that have to be filled out just because you go through the process of signing an application does not mean you're going to get funded because most programs are competitive. And it's easy for projects to fall through the cracks. Um, you know, that said, there are great opportunities to do land management and enhance critical habitats um, with Farm Bill. It's important to remember that funds are part of a contract. It's not a grant, it's a contract that you get paid. Um, once you do the work. So that's the way there are opportunities to get prepaid for for implementation, but for the most part, the landowner does the work and then request um, reimbursement. There are income limitations right now. It's nine hundred thousand dollars annually. That's a three year look back. So it's the average over the last three years for your adjusted gross income. There are penalties for not completing a contract, and uh, that's something that if you are advising a landowner or you suggest a landowner go into a farm bill uh, program, you want to make sure you understand what you're getting them in for. Um, and if they don't complete the work, there could be penalties. 
And I think the main thing from uh, private lands biologists and, and from growing uh, habitat management through farm bill on private lands is that we need to stay involved with the sign up process and with the contract process. Make sure that folks are moving forward the way that they they need to to uh, make everything work so that everybody ends up happy at the end of the day. So just to go through a couple of the, the major programs that are available with Farm Bill, Conservation Reserve Program or CRP is administered by the Farm Service Agency. Their cropland, grassland and pasture options uh, through CRP. There's funding for establishment as well as annual rental payments um, for folks that enroll their property in CRP. Continuous and general sign up, meaning some practices you can sign up for any time. Some you have to wait for an announcement and they batch applications and, uh, and rank to see who gets funded. And CRP has a minimum contract length of 10 years. And you know, really good program has a lot of opportunities and, and a lot of um, good that could be done with the program. But unfortunately, in much of the southeast, uh, a lot of acres of, of CRP go into loblolly pine plantations, and uh, there's several years in each contract that our habitat, quote, habitat looks like this. So it does have some issues. It's a, it's a much bigger tool in the Midwest, many more acres enrolled, uh, but we're always looking for ways to improve CRP in North Carolina as well. Environmental Quality Incentive Program or, or EQIP is administered by NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, the contracts with EQIP are five years or less. Forest fields and pasture lands can qualify for EQIP. There are some dedicated wildlife oriented funding pools. Um, the 2018 Farm Bill required 10% of the overall EQIP budgets per state to be uh, directed towards wildlife habitat projects. And there's a flat payment rate. You know what you're going to get paid before you sign the contract. So that's nice to know whenever um, you're, you're signing up for something you're going to have to do. It's nice to know what you can get reimbursed for doing that work. And some typical practices that we like to see funded and that are commonly funded with with EQIP or prescribed burning, early succession management, forest stand improvement, pollinator habitat establishment and management. The conservation stewardship program is another program that is available and, and does a lot of a lot of good work on the landscape. CSP has a five year contract requirement. It considers all the land holdings of the applicant. So if one landowner has property in other states and other counties, they have to include all that property in their uh, CSP application and contract. So it gets a little, little, get, little bit uh, complicated. Ranking is very competitive and somewhat complex. It pays, CSP pays stewardship payments for the level of management that you're already at, as well as paying for enhancements and practices that increase your conservation um, score. On well, CSP, there are some practices that have extremely high payment rates. Um, one, for example, is the, the current practice of planting 500 loblolly pine seedlings for quote, carbon sequestration. Um, sounds a lot like establishing a loblolly pine plantation for production. And right now in North Carolina, that's paying about $1,600 an acre to the landowner who uh, who signs up for CSP to, to plant these uh, carbon sequestration stands. Um, you know, it's probably costing them about $400 an acre to actually do the establishment. So they're pocketing about a thousand dollars and they end up a thousand dollars an acre and they end up with a, a pretty nice uh, pine plantation to manage for the next 30 years or so. Some other programs of note. The Joint Chiefs program uh, that focuses equip funds around the URA National Forest in North Carolina. It also provides some funding for additional management on the National Forest land. 
Regional Conservation Partnership Program, RCPP. Uh, that's a little more of a, a grant in that the Farm Bill Program uh, provides funds that match partners' contributions. And RCPP can be targeted to a species, a geographic location, uh, more of a, a targeted approach. Working Lands for Wildlife, um, so again, that focuses towards specific species in North Carolina. It's the bobwhite quail, goldwing warbler, and eastern hellbender each have a work and lands for wildlife priority area. And the Farm Bill does have easement programs as well with the um, ASAP program, Agriculture Conservation Easement Program, and Healthy Forest Reserve Program. So, Anytime I give a farm bill talk, we have to throw in the help me alphabet soup because farm bill can get really complicated. There's lots of different options, lots of nuances to, to help folks get enrolled um, and get habitat on the ground. But, you know, there's a, a couple of take home messages. And, you know, the first being that a, a plan is critical for management success and it's very critical for success when applying for and implementing a farm bill contract. As long as we're providing landowners high quality, good science based uh, management guidance, you know, we're certainly doing our part to help them succeed with farm bill applications and contracts. The other thing to remember is that uh, all the money is going to be spent. The state NRCS office does not like to return money to, to Washington. It makes them. Uh, I think there's some performance appraisals that probably get dinged if money goes back. So they want to spend all the money that is available to the state and we can just uh, you know, work together um, to make sure that we're getting as much of that money spent to improve wildlife habitat in the state as possible. So we talked a little bit about landowner uh, objectives, needs, a little bit about financial assistance and how we can reward landowners. But you know, if we can take a look back and, and maybe savor a few successes that we've had over the years, and that's what we're going to do is look at a couple of different projects that would even make Mark Jones smile. So uh, he, uh, he he loved to see work done on the ground, as do I. Uh, planning, outreach, um, a lot of things are good, but until we're getting habitat put on the ground, I don't really consider a lot of these projects successful. And you know, one of these successful projects that has gotten land put on the ground is, is Mr. Joe's project in Columbus County. And this is a, a project John Henry Harrelson has been working on um, since about 2013. It is in Columbus County, it's 175 acres with the goal of the landowner is to maintain early succession habitat. And whenever John Henry arrived and met Mr. Joe, there were already some CRP field borders, some fallow managed field borders on the property. And um, over time, those field borders have have expanded and recommendations have uh, expanded the acreage of early succession management on that property to, to 27 acres. Um, you know, made the note here about some of these have been managed for 22 years because to to keep early succession, early succession for 22 years is a, a pretty notable undertaking and accomplishment. Um, you can see there's some pine trees scattered out in there, but there's a lot of seed sources around this stand. A lot of, uh, a lot of trees just wanting to come up. So it's a, it's a testament to the guidance that John Henry has provided to Mr. Joe and Mr. Joe's efforts to maintain this habitat um, as viable early succession for so many years. In the forest land, there's been uh, multiple prescribed burns. Uh, this was following, this photo was following the first burn that actually uh, returned fire to this property for the first time in 60 years. This is shortly after the second burn. So there again, all timber stands have been burned at least twice, some up to five times. And this is one year after the second burn. So there again, you know, part of the success here, of course, is, is meeting the landowner's objectives. But 
you know, understanding that it's not a one time treatment and you're done to manage these critical habitats and these habitats that benefit species of greatest conservation need. Um, you know, it, it takes dedication from the biologist that's advising these landowners as well as the landowners to make sure that we we get projects that really meet the mark of uh, of habitat needs for these species that we're trying to to manage for. And as far as other activities, other management activities that have been done on Mr. Joe's property, canopy gaps, edge feathering, and um, planting native soft mass shrubs have all taken place on the property. Funding, equip, CSP, and CRP have all been used on the property. You know, we think about private lands and, you know, why are we managing or helping this landowner to manage their property? There's there's no benefit once we get outside that property line. And, you know, a good project and a good project area will grow. So the progress that the neighbors have seen on Mr. Joe's property has, you know, spurred them to up their management. They now see what the potential of their property is by looking at Mr. Joe's property. And of course, John Henry has been able to talk with these adjacent landowners, these other folks in the neighborhood to grow and expand what has been done on one tract to adjacent and nearby tracts as well. So including uh, reintroducing fire onto a track that hadn't been burned in over 20 years. So the other success that I wanted to make sure that we talked about was corporate cure. And you know, the question of why is corporate cure part of a private lands discussion uh, of course, that's a good question, but we'll talk more about why that is as we go along. Um, Corporate Cure started about 20, 2003. Uh, currently, there's about 24,000 acres that are being managed or impacted by the work there. The initial funding was through a Department of Justice grant, and the uh, the goal for corporate cure was to enhance early successional habitat and document water quality benefits from that management. So we can't really say much about corporate cure without talking about Benji and the different approach with with corporate cure is that a dedicated and and, and dedicated Benji's been very dedicated to this uh, project for years. A permanent full time biologist on the ground to coordinate and implement the management activities, but also to coordinate documentation surveys um, to be able to see what the benefit of the work on the ground has been. So, even though we're talking early succession, it's been more than just herbaceous vegetation management, there's been long leaf established that have been managed to enhance the ecosystem. Benji loves to be recognized, not really, but uh, he has been recognized for his efforts to benefit not just wildlife through the corporate cure program, but also the soil and water concerns uh, that arise on corporate swine production farms. Here's some example of some management areas and. You know, more than just fur, fur and feathers. Um, a lot of things have happened uh, on the corporate cure area that have benefited um, pollinators and other beneficial insects. And a lot of this stuff was not even recognized as a as a benefit back when this started in 2003-2004. And then as far as why is this important from a private land standpoint? Uh, there's been outreach programs that were held at least annually, maybe more frequently than that, uh, pre-COVID. So hundreds of uh, hundreds of folks have been to this property, seen the benefit that has happened through active management that can happen by active management on a, a corporate swine farm in eastern North Carolina. The funding. Um, has been through, like, as mentioned earlier, Department of Justice and various farm bill uh, whenever private tracks are involved. 
And I think this is really the, the take home as far as where private lands have come into play. Um, you can see up here we have the Ammon farm in red. That was kind of the, the original corporate cure farm. Um, and then over time, the footprint of corporate cure has expanded uh, to reach that 24,000 acres that is currently impacted by the efforts on, on the corporate cure and of the corporate cure program. And then you notice also that there are a significant amount of, of private lands uh, tracks that are involved with this project. And, you know, I think the other key thing is that the relationships and, and the communication with landowners in this uh, focal area has led to um, the Bladen Lakes Area Prescribed Burn Association, so neighbors helping neighbors uh, burn it here at a local local uh, level. Uh, there's been funding that has helped to uh, to bring some retired Forest Service folks in to do some some training associated with the uh, Prescribed Burn Association. Uh, there's been multiple NGOs that have put staff uh, in this focal area or who have taken advantage of the success on this focal area. And also uh, the southeastern focal area, that's kind of the cure, um, the basis for the cure work, has also steered funding through CRP as far as uh, providing some opportunities to, to focus Farm Bill funds through the CRP program, as well as the Working Lands for Wildlife program um, in that area. So even though it was corporate cure, it certainly expanded beyond the bounds of the uh, swine farms there and is impacting a much larger landscape. So we know we can have successes. We, we know we have opportunities to to help landowners. And I guess the majority of the rest of the presentation is bringing up questions on how can we better meet, what tools do we have to better meet agency habitat goals on private lands? How do we address those limitations? Um, and there's lots of things that are already being done. Hopefully we can do more. Um, you know, one thing that I've recognized since I've become the, the wildlife habitat coordinator is that there, there's a lot of interest from multiple divisions and programs in private land management. Um, yeah, I do think we have opportunities for broader staff engagement. Um, and there's certainly things that I, I did not realize, um, especially going with, with HABCON, going on with HABCON folks and aquatic diversity folks, um, that good, and productive private lands management can can really have a, a big impact on some of the things that they're focusing more on. You know, marketing is something that I think we really need to take a look at more closely. The, um, the ad hoc private lands evaluation report uh, focused on marketing and, and letting the public know the importance of private lands as well as uh, letting landowners know the services that we provide um, as something that we really need to expand and, and do a better job of. So hopefully we can expand our marketing coming up in the not too distant future. You know, we've used direct call share from the Wildlife Commission in the past with some of the cure opportunities, uh, the private lands cure programs in the past. What we found is once the uh, call share money goes away, generally so does the habitat. But, you know, is a Wildlife Commission call share program an option? If so, what would that look like? What would we reward and how would we motivate landowners? More partners biologists. Um, some of the NGOs are, are bringing more staff to the state. How do we engage that staff? How do we engage those uh, NGO partners to have the most impact on our agency's goals for species of greatest conservation needs uh, that we possibly can? You 
Yeah, or are we just kind of waiting on Rawa to to balance out all our private lands concerns? And I, I don't keep day to day rec or, uh, reports on how Rawa is going. Hopefully, it's something that will provide some funding that can help not just some of the the other projects that are recommended for the commission, but also some private lands work. I think we we could have a lot of successes if we're managing with raw funds on private lands. So one last visit here with Aldo Leopold. And I think this kind of sums up a lot of what we have to deal with with private landowners. You know, the crux of the problem is every landowner is a custodian to two interests, not always identical, the public and his or her own. What we need is a positive inducement or reward for the landowner who respects both interests in his or her, her actual land practices. All conservation problems, erosion, forestry, game, wildflowers, landscapes ultimately, ultimately boil down to this. So there again, identifying high quality landowners, understanding their goals and objectives, providing them good information on how they can move towards those goals and objectives and you know trying to figure out the right incentive or reward to help them cross the finish line on their habitat management projects um, are all critical components of working with private landowners and and all things that whether you're in in wildlife diversity whether you're in, in habcon whether you're in wildlife management, surveys and research, even enforcement. Um, you know, being able to uh, explain what the Wildlife Commission can offer private landowners, the importance of private landowners, and, and building those relationships, because oftentimes, oftentimes the first staff person that meets a landowner is the one that they remember and that has a lot of influence on that landowner. So we need to make sure that we're getting a, a good message out about the importance of private lands, the importance of private lands management, and what we can offer as an agency to better assist private landowners with the management of their property. And, you know, with that, I'm done. I appreciate your time. And uh, anyone who, who has ideas on how we can expand our private lands program, make it more efficient, um, make it more effective especially for for wildlife action plan species and species of greatest conservation need i mean I'd, I'd love to talk private lands love to to get some additional ideas on how we can improve the program and with that dr cobb i appreciate it and i'll try to figure out how to get back on the teams here all right thank you very much john that was a great presentation on a uh, really important um, uh, and, and complicated uh, topic. And so we're going to start out. Uh, Director Ingram has his hand up, so we're going to start out with him. Hey, hey, John. Thanks, David. You didn't have to call me first. Uh, thanks for the super presentation, John. And um, it's extremely informative and uh, well prepared. Um, I did have a question. You mentioned marketing, and, and when you were going over the presentation, I was thinking about that. And and you also mentioned, you know, our first contacts in, in the field and making good impressions on people. But and those are so related. But uh, I live over near the mega site in Randolph, Guilford, Alamance counties over that way, and I can't help but think about when I fly over it or I'm around it, all the, the habitat destruction that's been, that, that that area is causing, it's just a huge, huge area. It used to be some prime farmland up through there and and with the, the, the other sites in Chatham and always RTP expansion. Do we do anything, John, on, on, um, on marketing and outreach in those areas where there's been such a loss of, of habitat, um, and do you think that's an area that we should improve in on? I, I know a lot of landowners that have received a lot of calls, of course, from mitigation groups in those areas. 
and I know uh, I, one in particular in Southern Guilford, Northern Randolph County near Climax there that's, that's doing a couple programs, one with ag, uh, you know, with a an easement and also with some mitigation, with mitigation services and and some, and he's always interested in habitat stuff and he's recently reached out to me, but is that something that we target uh, on some of these developed areas? I think we do have opportunities. I think we have have started to to do a little more targeted um, work on smaller scale, so call them smaller scale projects. I know Green Growth Toolbox has been very important for years on reaching out to uh, to get a foot in the door, you know, pre development. Um, you know, we are looking at more opportunities on smaller backyards and. Uh, you know, even corporate landscaping situations as far as benefiting the species that can use those sites. And I mean, I think all our staff are engaged with land trust and other groups um, that we can direct landowners towards that uh, that seem like they're good fits there. I, you know, I often, often think of it as, as kind of the baby step uh, mentality of, hey, you know, if we can get somebody to, to manage early succession and they're excited about that, they go to the next step and the next step and, and eventually uh, some of those folks are going to go to a permanent easement. So I, I don't know that we have a specific way that we're targeting uh, those areas that you're discussing um, specifically, but we we are looking at ways and we have historically work with those conservation groups to try to make some of that longer term uh, more longer uh, the longer term conservation um, work for landowners that are interested in that thanks john all right great are there any other uh, any other questions if not john i'm gonna jump in and ask you one um you know, when I got first got the idea of asking you to do this talk from someone on our agency staff, it struck me that what you're dealing with here really incorporates at least four different kinds of science. And you've heard me talk about this over the years in the, you know, in the past, and that is biological science, social science, uh, political science and 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 economics. Um, and I think you've hit on all those things in your presentation. My question is, do you think that we fully utilize our opportunities for our social science staff to engage in this work and potentially use those folks to learn more across a broader landscape about what might help those of you like you that are implementing this work on the ground? That's a, that's an easy one. Uh, I, I don't think that we're, we're utilizing, fully utilizing that, that component. Um, you know, several years ago, we tried to, to ramp up um, some of that research oriented uh, social science uh, approach to things. Uh, let's see, Ann May was still here, and I guess uh, Christopher, somebody else have to get his name right. But, um, you know, the, the thought process was that we could go through a research project and, and you know, surveys, um, focus groups, you know, really building it and gaining that data that we need. And in three years, we will wind up with with a product. Um, and to be honest, we, we being uh, that my supervisor at the time and myself really, really felt like that was a lot of time that we could be spent, we could be spent doing and improving habitat on the ground. Um, you know, I, I think there's great opportunities. I think we do need to learn more about what steers landowners um, to make management decisions um, 
and that's certainly something that that would be great to develop um, and, and get more details on, especially if we move towards a improved or, or expanded marketing program. You know, we need to know what message to get out there before we undertake a lot of uh, marketing efforts. OK, great. Thanks for that. Um, are there any anybody else that have any questions for John? We still got a few more minutes before we wrap it up. I uh, appreciate everybody that that uh, joined in uh, to listen to John's presentation again. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up and say thanks again and everybody have a good rest of your day.